All right, guys, I have two uh, very talented artists with me today, and they uh, reached out to me and they wanted to know a little bit about more, a little more about sync licensing, specifically the music library side of the business. Um, they're fairly well educated actually on sync licensing, um, but they're in a really unique spot where they basically have original artist careers already running, they're already touring, they already have content going out there. And so they've obviously been aware of sync licensing, but they wanna really know about how do you balance the two because many of you watching might have a bit of a fan base, social media presence, you got music out there, streaming, uh, music videos, an email list, right? You might have a lot of stuff going on in your original artist um, career. And maybe the sort of whispers of sync licensing has kind of been coming into your ear and you're, you've been thinking about it, but you really just don't know how to balance that. Should you put a lot of focus on it? Should you put just a little bit of a focus on it? Um, and some artists actually def decide later, this is what I did actually 11 years, is that I basically completely abandoned my artist band sort of uh, approach and I went 100% into the sync licensing world. So there's all different types of spectrums and approaches for people to go and I hope in this a um, little bit of a consulting uh, session that we're doing here with these two artists, we can get to the bottom of that. And so not only for them, they can have some clarity on what might be the best fit for them because there's not just one single fit for every artist. Everybody has their own unique needs and, and interests and goals in their careers. And hopefully for you watching that you can get something out of this conversation too. So you know exactly what might be the best approach for you moving forward. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you guys to uh, Sonic Scott and Christina. They are our two um, incredible artists and I'm gonna put their links to all their music below so you guys can check them out. So welcome guys, how you doing? Good. Awesome. <laughs> so why don't we go ahead and start with you, Christina. Why don't you go ahead and give me a little bit of a, some background of where you are in your career right now, what you've been doing for the last couple of years with your music and where you are in terms of sync licensing, like how far into the weeds are you? How far have you really dug into this, uh, this industry so far? Yeah, that's definitely. So um, definitely my background in music, I've always, um, I started playing the guitar when I was at a young age and just created my own like melodies and, and chords. My brother had a guitar. Ever since then, I kind of morphed into creating like piano melodies. And so I got kind of like guitar kind of music kind of like got a little bit more technical and, and it was just like in a definitely a rough time in my life. I actually just pick up the piano and I took piano lessons for about a year. And I just started creating just melodies like out of just the pain of whatever I went through when I was in a uh, when I was 17. And ever since then, I've been creating melodies and be able to train to create um, piano instrumentals and on the keyboard. And then I got um, experience using GarageBand and I created more music and then adding layering my, you know, my tracks with synths and 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 then kind of change into more of a cinematic approach. And then it was like probably about like, um, I also had went on a um, music internship trip with um, Benjamin Dunn and, and the Animal Orchestra. It was just like a music small short term internship where they kind of t taught us what it, what life is like on the road with a band touring, but it's like a whole like one month internship where we actually met in Alabama and then like we actually drove to Tampa, Florida and went to their shows. Um, and, and kind of, they kind of also taught us and kind of showed us how we can refine our own songs on the road in the van and, um, just show us kind of like, if I had a song that he was able, the, um, Ben and also the booking manager was able to kind of like show me like how I can refine my songs. But besides that, like I've also had, um, I also was kind of slightly like I set up shows for a skillet. Um, back then when I was 17, 18 too, with my ex-boyfriend, I set up the, the shows for them, for the band. I did set up uh, the arena for Bryce Jordan Center um, as a stage crew. So I kind of had a little bit of experience kind of setting up the bands and back then. And then, um, and then it was just maybe 2015, um, I went to Nashville for a music, kind of like a uh, music school, kind of like a music ministry school, but it's more like charity based and we kind of learn how to um, create music on stage as a group um, kind of like it's more like a worship kind of setting so uh, for four months in 2015 so I kind of learned how to work as a team with a band and I currently am also now kind of helping with kind of more of the um, spontaneous spontaneous and also worship jams in San Diego for burn 24/ um, 7. 
So it's just like a kind of like spontaneous jam for just prayer and worship. Um, and then I went back to Nashville last year just to get more of a connecting, more of a um, with other music industry people uh, with helping music evolve at the home center um, last year and just getting more um, like getting to know more people in the industry. So that's a little bit my background, but ever since when I started creating piano instrumentals, I've always done more spontaneous creating of my music. And then um, when I was in Nashville, I had more of a vision and a passion to want to release it in films and TV, but I never had anyone who told me how about the single licensing world. But I've always had that in my heart. I wanted to release it in like films such as The Beautiful Mind or or anything like that. And But I've also been able to kind of um, went more of an electronic, I'll create some songs and I'll, they'll kind of change into more of an electronic like um, music for my songs. So I've had different ideas, I've always heard melodies, but I play by ear, but I've never been really classically trained in my gifting for music. So ever since I found out, it was just this summer, it was my first time I heard about sync in August when the course started with Kathy, Kathy's course and I just, found, you know, the, the ad that they, they showed advertised on Facebook. I was like, you know, she had a five day songwriting, um, uh, workshop. And I was like, I was like, wow. And she's like talking about putting music in films. I was like, this must be an opportunity where I can get more educated and to know a little, a little about the, you know, business side, the legal side, a little bit about what I can do. And so ever since then, I've just, you know, been really drawn to, be more interested and educated for sync and that's how i got into sync so i've been doing that since august till now and and creating um, more of a songs for that so that's a little bit of my journey with music and sync and that's where i am now and hope to learn how to you know more of the legal side and also in in every aspect for sync Awesome. Yeah. And it sounds like um, sync licensing is more of one of your primary focuses. I know that you obviously mm -hmm. are putting out uh, music or wanting to put out music also to maybe create a uh, generate a fan base and um, sort of create a buzz for yourself. But it definitely sounds like that piqued your interest. And you probably had an interest in doing this for a long mm -hmm. time and just visualizing right. your music placed in TV shows, movies mm -hmm. and commercials. So sounds like you're in the right place. You're obviously in the in the right direction. Hopefully we can help you um, even get more focused on maybe one particular direction that might help. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into that in just a second. So Thank Sonic you. Scott, why don't you give us your uh, background, what you've been doing in your music career for the last couple of years, and what your intentions are with sync licensing and why it, it attracted you. Yeah, okay, cool. So I got started at a really young age, around seven, and I started playing guitar. Around 15, I really started to get, uh, like, to dedicate myself. Got into vocals around 15 and was just writing songs, like, right from the age of 15. Uh, I got into a band. This is I'm from Ontario, Canada, so I... Uh, that's where I started off and I got into a band like kick butt in a band for like, uh, for like, uh, seven years or so in Ontario touring all around Southern Ontario. So I've, I'm a touring artist, you know, touring artist for like many years now. And so, um, and then from there, the band kind of dwindled off. So I, I kind of like broke it off with the band and ended up, uh, going to split off into like kind of my own solo career. So now like I'm Sonic is my stage name. And, uh, so, and then so I went to get a, I kind of split off and kind of went to Vancouver. So I went to live in Vancouver for like eight months and I did a, I acquired like a music business degree. So I have a music business degree now and I'm kind of just still pursuing uh, my solo artist uh, career. I'm still, uh, so right now I'm down in the United States doing like a little bit of a solo tour uh, of Arizona, like Phoenix, uh, I went up and did uh, San Francisco, now I'm down here in San Diego, and you go to LA next. And so, um, and so I'm just pursuing that now that I have my like background from school, and uh, that's just yeah. And I've been taking a course online as well for like music licensing, as well. So I kind of plan on using like the music licensing avenue along with the artist career avenue. 
Awesome. Yeah. So for your situation, it sounds like obviously you've already got a fan base. You've already been touring. This has been your gig. It's been your bread and butter for a long time. So you're seeing licensing as sort of that additional um, outlet that you can not only get some more exposure from if you get some prominent placements, but you could obviously earn those upfront sync fees, back end royalties. Um, and especially if you're looking forward to retirement at some point, you probably want some passive income building up and you don't want to always have to be on the road to get your next paycheck. So that's that's a very smart thing for you to do. And you're, you look like a very young guy. So I'm, you, you're very yeah. ahead of the curve for that. And you're thinking about this stuff at a young age, which is really, really cool. So yeah. before we get into it, I would say there's one thing that I want to make sure that everybody's watching and including you guys um, is aware of in terms of, I think there's basically two primary paths you can take in sync licensing. Now, I think what you guys have been learning about and what you guys have really been entertaining in terms of your your music has been the path where you go with a sync agent. And that would be somebody mm -hmm. that is basically just like an agent that would just uh, represent your music for you. And they go and pitch your tracks to, let's say, music supervisors or ad agencies or film producers or trailer houses, anybody who's basically needing music for their TV shows, movies, commercials, video games, you name it. Um, and this sync agent would basically represent your original music that you created for yourself, for your fans, but you're not really necessarily creating music for the sync licensing industry. And I hope you guys are all very clear on what I mean by that. Um, a lot of times what sync agents want to do, and it's kind of like what gets them out of bed in the morning and what makes them want to pitch your music is A, they have to love your tracks. Like they have to just be in love with your music and B, they have the incentive to, to say and want to say, I'm the one that broke this artist. This artist became a you know international hit act because I got them placed on this TV show or I got their track placed on this trailer. So that helps the sync agent sort of create a name for themselves by promoting your original music that they're just a fan of that they love. So that is one method that mm -hmm. I think if you are primarily focused on artist music, and I'm just going to call it artist music, where you have a fan base, you have a social media presence, you're touring like Sonic Scott is. Um, if you're doing that kind of thing and streaming and all that kind of stuff, then it seems like a sync agent, I think, is your best play because you don't have to spend a lot of time adjusting anything for them because most of the time you're just going to be sending them your catalog they might need you to do some alt mixes which would mean you create different versions of your tracks maybe a 60 second version a 30 second version hopefully you have access to your session files if not you got to go back to the studio wherever you got them done and hopefully be able to no negotiate to figure out how to get those done um, sometimes you might need to put some descriptors some metadata some small things but it's not rocket science for the most part you can and a lot of sync agents how they work is you literally just send them a streaming link to maybe your full album, if you're gonna let them represent your full album, make sure that link does not expire. That's a big thing that people mistake. They, they, they send something like on Dropbox and Dropbox might just automatically delete links after a while or they just forget that that link is live with somebody and then the artist deletes that link and so suddenly those uh, tracks are not available. Um, so make sure that they're available for that sync agent and most importantly, they can be streamed and downloaded if need be because if there's a client that needs a song and they love your song, they can't download it though, you might miss out on the opportunity. So those are just some common sense things to go. If again, primarily your focus is you wanna be on stage, you want the fan base, you want the tour, you wanna to put out music videos. Like if you really wanna go that path, I think that is the way for you to go. And so I think what it comes down to, for especially for you two that are here with me, is to really kind of go into your gut and really think about what do you wanna do most do you want to tour do you want to put out original music do you want to create a fan base and you know these days with uh with social media there are techniques and strategies out there to gain and gather a fan base and i think in some ways it's easier than ever before in other ways it's harder than ever before because there's so much noise and there's so many artists out there but i think if you have a strategy for how to find the people that are into what you're doing you can obviously create um, a niche a little fan base for yourself and you don't need a lot of like you know millions of people to create a sustainable income for yourself a couple thousand people that just love what you do and they're willing to you know support you financially if it's patreon or just buying your stuff like you can actually do really well these days but you got to be disciplined and you got to do a lot of it yourself obviously you can't really outsource everything to other people so that's that pathway i think going with the sync agent now the other path this is the path that i took and this is the path that I teach with Sync Academy, Sync Edge, my YouTube channel, everything that I do is directly partnering with music libraries. So this is for the producer that's not necessarily interested in touring, um, maybe getting a lot of the spotlight because on this side of the business, we get barely any attention or any credit on, on screen. But what we do get is we get paid, we get our consideration fees, we get sync fees and we get royalties. And I think that's, obvi that's obviously awesome, but primarily it's for the producer that just 
loves being in their own home studio, just loves cranking out music, just loves producing, loves the, the art of working with their DAW, working with their their, their um, uh, MIDI keyboard, messing with plugins, messing, messing with sounds, plugging in their guitar. Like if that's really where you thrive and you kind of get your own paycheck just from the craft of making music, I think that's what this side, this uh, this path and this approach is because we're not getting any fans screaming our names. We're not getting anybody. We get no spotlights on us. We get really very little credit. There's no red carpets for us. There's just not a lot of um, public notoriety that we're going to get on this side of the business. So again, that's not pro or con or anything, but it's just there's different personality types and different goals that each one of these approaches work with. So working direct with, with music libraries, it's a little bit more proactive. It's a little bit more aggressive in that you don't have to just, like with a sync agent, you just basically give them your music. And if there's an opportunity for your music, for a certain, for, for a certain TV show, film, trailer, whatever, at the right time, then you get the placement and it's great, but it's very passive. It's kind of just throwing your stuff out there, seeing what sticks, right? With libraries and what I do is a lot more aggressive and where I will go partner with a library and I'll ask them, what do you need? What are you working on? A lot of the stuff you can actually find out by just analyzing their, their website and we can talk about that. But you can kind of guess or just talk to them directly and see what kind of clients they have. Is it a lot of reality TV shows? Is it a lot of ad campaigns? Ask them what they're looking for, ask them what their clients need, and then if you can create something very high quality and very licensable in that particular style or genre, you directly give it to the library and now you're aggressively being shopped for current opportunities. So you can see that's a little bit different than just, here's the stuff that I make. If it's ever relevant for some of your clients, hopefully that works, right? So that's kind of more what you're doing on the sync agent side. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but you just obviously aren't gonna be as aggressive with that because they don't want you to pitch for their opportunities. That's not what sync agents want. They want you to create your own original music that you just love so that it just it's very authentic to you and that's what they want to pitch. So, you know, pros and cons. I think if you're going in the sync agent world, uh, your, your primary focus shouldn't obviously be on sync agents. It should be on your artistry. It should be on building up your fan base, building up your buzz. Because the more that this buzz generates here with your artist music, the more that people are going to hear about it over here in the sync world. And you might actually even be getting, not even just through your sync agent, but if you get a big enough buzz, like online, you get a viral hit or something like that, you might have supervisors coming to you directly. Hey, we want to use your music. We love this track. This track went all over, you know, went crazy on YouTube or on Facebook or Instagram. Can we use it for our next campaign? That's where you'll see those kind of opportunities when your buzz organically just grows. So that's why I've said if, if sync agents and that sort of secondary approach to licensing is where you want to go, Go for it. Absolutely. I don't think you should be spending a lot of time thinking about this side of it. I think you, you find that right sync agent that believes in you, send them the music that they need, you know, make sure you agree to their terms, sign your contract and just let them do their thing and then get right back to your artistry. That's what you should be doing focused on. But right. again, if you want to go to my side of the industry of what I've done, there is no artistry. There is no, you know, I have no fan base. I have no, no nobody knows me uh, as, as an artist or as a producer in the sort of public space. Okay. They know the me in the, what's that? <laughs> You got a cool podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I got a podcast, but it's all about sync licensing. So yes, I, I have created my own social media presence around sync licensing though. But I had a band many years ago. I don't know if you guys know my backstory. I was signed to Tyrese Gibson, had a production deal, was flowing all over the country, from meeting with major labels. I thought I was there. I thought I had arrived. I was about to blow up. Didn't work out. The band broke up. But I did want to make music my full-time income. And so for me, music licensing with libraries was that direct path for me. So enough of a, a rant there. Um, with that said, do you guys have any um, maybe further thoughts on which one of those directions seems like it works better for you or that you'd want to maybe follow in? So uh, I'm, I'm doing the artist. Like I, I like touring. I want to tour. That's my main focus right now. And I think everything kind of comes around that for me. And uh, yeah, and just to segue what you just said about the legal would be going, knowing about contracts and the legal. I've got one contract from a sync agency but i didn't sign it <laughs> and so i'm just not sure about it how about you christina yeah so for me definitely i was like you know uh trying to still trying to like weave in and out to see maybe later on i will build that artist fan base with my more my electronic because i've always wanted to do edm but cinematic and edm but i feel like it could be simultaneously like but definitely I've heard, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to see about building a fan base, but I am really interested in the musical library where I can create not really more so tour because I've tried to do that and not, not so much of a fan, like being on the road and, you know, that lifestyle. So I'm thinking like maybe more for music libraries 
maybe, and maybe it could be for a season type, seasonal type of thing. I do the music library, and once I build, you know, I don't know, more of a consistent income from music libraries, then I can also build my fan base maybe at the same time or something like that, and then move on to more of a fan base. So kind of working with that. Perfect. This is great because you guys are kind of split right down the middle, which is perfect. Yeah. Sonic Scott, you're you're definitely you're very clear on where you want to go. And Christina, I think you you're very smart to kind of. It seems like sync licensing is attracting you more right now, and so that might be something you do want to just yeah. go full full. You know, put put jump both uh, feet in and and go for it, and just kind of see where it takes you. Um, yeah. And then you can reevaluate after maybe a year or so mm -hmm. and see if you want to maybe focus in other areas or just want to double down with licensing. So that's really cool. Yeah. So let's talk about the contracts. Um, so Sonic, you were talking about. Um, legal stuff when it comes to a sync agency. Um, I can tell you that there are sync agents that have all different types of terms. What I definitely think is a red flag and you should stay completely away from is anybody charging you up front. So if they're charging you anything like a monthly fee or an annual retainer or anything to shop your music, number one, they don't really believe in your music. Why are they charging you if they're they're asking for money? So that should be just straight off the bat. Those are the kind of deals that I was seeing last year from some of my students. They're like, hey, this guy wants $1,500 a month to rep my music. I'm like, 15, and it was like a 12 year or 12 year, 12 month commitment, 60 day cancellation notice. I mean, it was, they were gouging people. I couldn't believe this was even out there, but th that's out there. There are people out there that are taking advantage of newbies that don't know that you don't have to pay anything. And I'm talking about, yeah, not even 50 bucks a month, not even a hundred, like no money should be sent to a sync agent if they're reg legitimate. Cause you got to think about their incentives. If you're paying them, whether or not they get you placements or not, What's their incentive to shop for you? They should only, I think the golden rule should be, they should only be making money when, they, when they've successfully gotten you a placement. So that keeps them hungry, right? That keeps them, they, they, they only um, uh, eat when they get the hunt, when they make the kill, right? When they actually go out and get the actual placement for you, then they can actually wet their beak, so to speak, and actually get paid for it. So, but in terms of the, the uh, splits and the how much they're gonna take on that, uh, as far as I understand it, the fairest deals I've seen out there are anywhere from 25 to 50% of the um, fees that are earned from, it could be um, uh, sync fees. And I think some, most sync agents do not even touch the um, publishing side of things or certainly not the writer side of things. I think the writer share should never be touched unless you, you guys I know are maybe co-writing or sort of co-producing some stuff. If you're co-producing, that's a different thing. But if you're a solo artist, no, nobody even on, on library side should be touching your writer share. That is 100% you if you are the writer. Some sync agents might ask for a bit of the publishing on the back end. A lot of them don't. Uh, I think it's better, obviously, when they don't. But if they do, you know, it's not necessarily a, a deal breaker, but you got to think like, all right, well, maybe I'll give them six months or a year, see what they can secure. Because giving up maybe a small portion of your publishing back end results in a lot more money, right? Because you could take 100% of your publishing, but that means you might have missed out on some great placements with them. So it's kind of hard to tell in the beginning. Um, if they take right. a portion of your publishing, does that make you no longer one stop if you're one stop before? Say it again. Does that make you no longer a one stop like a uh, song if they take a portion of your publishing? Well, what do you mean? Like, so if they're represent, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing they're going to exclusively represent your song, right? For a sync licensing, correct? Uh, I was thinking non-exclusive, but if they take if they take publishing, does that make them exclusive? Like, does that make it able, so I'm not able to pitch to other So you're people? not likely to find, I don't, maybe these people did offer you a non-exclusive contract, but when it comes to a sync agent representing your music for the licensing business, they should be the legit ones, the ones that are actually gonna do the best work for you are gonna ask for exclusivity. So okay. if they're saying, and I don't know exactly what this, maybe you can clarify with whatever their contract yeah. said. So it was, the reason I didn't sign it was extremely, extremely confusing. It was about the retitling tracks. I, I know you have already seen on your stream that you've talked about it a few times, but the main reason why I didn't talk, I didn't sign it was because it was retitling. So it was already confusing because it was my first one to begin with. But the, the other, so they wanted to take 100% of the publishing from the, their retitled track but the reason I didn't sign it is because there was also a clause in there that said they wanted to act like in perpetuity as my attorney. So I was like, that doesn't sounds like a conflict of interest. I don't think I want to do that. And then, and then also, I think they were going to get into trouble because I'm releasing my track and they're just re retitling the same track. So like, if you know, like sound scan online, like sound scan is going to catch that. And then if I signed that and it said they were my attorney in like, in fact, in, in perpetuity, I was like, I don't like the idea the sounds of that. Big red flag. Why are they your attorney? This is going to be a sync agency. You're not signing yeah. them as an attorney. So that's yeah. a weird thing to throw in there. Don't like that. And no. no, I am not a fan. And definitely from the mouth of Mark Freezer, who runs Sync Summit and has his own sync agency and is one of the center 
people in that entire world, he'll say, stay away from retitling. You're going to run into problems. There's going to be all, there could be lawsuits. There could be issues. You already you're already aware of all that. So no, I don't think. And this was a sync agency, right? Not a library. It was an agency, yes, and it was non-exclusive. But then, yeah, every title track. So no, I I don't think that would be where I would go personally. Again, I don't tell people what to do. You have to make your own decisions. But for myself, if I were an artist and what I've learned from going to Sync Summit and learning and and hearing directly from Sync agents, pretty much every Sync agent on the stage said the same thing. We don't deal with retitling. We don't deal with non-exclusive. If you believe in us and we believe in you, we're going to ask for exclusive rights to distribute your music to Sync opportunities. Um, But If it was a library, is that the same case? Like to not do retitling? Uh, libraries, uh, I also believe the same thing is happening there. Um, they, that has been going away big time, the retitling, the non-exclusive stuff. So I think that is also something I do not highly recommend people get involved with. The only way that I would say, uh, if you are an art, like for you, you obviously have original music. Let's say instead of going with a sync agent exclusively for licensing opportunities, you wanted to maybe go with a library. Um, you might be able to go to a non-exclusive library to say, hey, my music is already being distributed through, I don't know where it's iTunes, Spotify, wherever your music is out there. So you could go to them to say, you guys don't get exclusive rights to, and they're not asking for that because they're non-exclusive, but we're not retitling my tracks, but I'm going to allow you guys to put your put my tracks in your library to shop to your clients if you'd like to. So that would be a non-exclusive agreement you could have with them. Um, so that would be one way you could go about it with libraries. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. So in terms of the um, publishing, though, that's another big thing that I wanted to talk about. So when you work with um, uh, a library, now this is this is one thing for essentially for exclusive libraries, um, and uh, maybe uh, Sonic, you would definitely want to know this as well because when you are right now, you're touring, you're selling your own music. Uh, do you have a publishing deal, or are you just self-published? I have my own publishing company. Okay, so you got your own publishing company. So you right now have all of your, you have a plan and a purpose and a, and a business model set up around keeping your publishing because it sounds like you're open to maybe even getting signed with a deal later on or maybe working with a publishing company, but you definitely sound like you are, are an artist that is, um, you're monetizing your publishing. There, there, yeah. There's definitely income coming in from that. So for you to go to a, a library, exclusive music library, they're going to want to require to take exclusive rights to your publishing. And that's where a lot of artists go, oh my gosh, it's a scam, don't do it. Mm-hmm. It's not a scam, it is a business model though. And it has to be done that way so that anytime they need to get a track placed with their clients, they don't have to come back to you with a new contract and ask for permission. Because you can be getting two, three, 10 placements a day in this industry with, with music libraries. They're not coming back to you that many times. Yeah. This music or this uh, side of the business needs to work on speed. It needs to go very, very quickly. So for an artist like you, I don't think you're going to want to go take all this music that you've created over your career and hand the publishing over to a library, especially since you have a plan and a purpose for what you're doing with it. So a couple of uh, options for you are, number one, you can create a secondary catalog and you can even use a different name if you want to. You don't have to go under your Sonic Scott or whatever your, your artist name might be. You can actually create a completely different alias so it's not even connected to you or it can be connected to you. I know that there are some artists that are very big in the um, sync licensing world and they released art and music under their name in the sync licensing world. It's not for their fans. They don't really put it out there publicly, but they can. They can tell their social media followers about it and say, hey, this is what I'm doing in the sync licensing business. It adds credibility to you that you're actually getting out there and getting your music on TV and say, hey, stay tuned. You might you, you might be hearing some of my music on some of your favorite TV shows, movies, and commercials. So it can be an ad for you as well. And of course, if you get a placement under that name, under that banner, then that's huge exposure for your artistry, right? Then you can basically completely show that off and be like, hey, check this out, check that out. So you you can get article interviews, you can get people to review your music, right? So that's just one way you can kind of springboard your notoriety, your exposure a little bit by using this medium uh, of, of music libraries and licensing. Um, but again, the other thing you can do is just complete an alias, uh, completely create some brand new artist name or just some other you know, company basically that you want to uh, operate under. So it's just completely separated. You never have to tell your fans you're doing it. You never have to tell anybody you're doing it. It can just be a secondary source. So when you're on the road, let's say you got a couple of down days and you want to create something, then you start to create some music and build up a catalog for uh, an exclusive music library. And in that catalog, it's completely different, right? Your artist stuff stays your artist stuff. This could be your sync licensing stuff where you're open to signing over your publishing. You're open to, um, you know, doing a different sort of a deal there. So that would be something to consider about where you want to go. But if you want to um, just only create original music for your, your, you know, your original albums and touring and stuff, it seems like a sync agent, an exclusive sync agent would be probably the way for you to go. Does that make sense? Okay. 
uh, and why an exclusive one as opposed to non-exclusive one? Well, like we just said before, the retitling and the sort of the other problem that will happen, let's say that you go to one non-exclusive sync agent and you also go to another non-exclusive sync agent, right? And so they both are representing right. your catalog. One gets the placement, the other one goes, hey, no, 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 we're representing his catalog, that's our placement. You get this little fight back and forth going on there. It can create problems with the music supervisor who was looking for it. And if there's obviously retitling going on, that's going to create all those other problems. So when I say exclusive, that's where I want to make sure I'm very clear on that. When I talk about when you sign with a, a sync agent exclusively, it's only exclusive in terms of them pitching for sync opportunities. They're not taking right. control of your publishing. They're not saying you can't put your music on iTunes or, or go tour with it. They're not asking for exclusive control or, or distribution rights to your music. They're just saying, hey, for anything when it re regards to a sync licensing opportunity, you let us handle your catalog. And I do think you should let one company handle your entire catalog. Don't just give like, okay, one album exclusively to them, the second album exclusively to this company. Again, you wanna create loyalty and you wanna create a relationship, an ongoing relationship. Because the other thing, let's say that one supervisor loves a track off of your first album and they go, we love this artist, we want more. They're like, well, we only have one album. He's only letting us do one album. You might have limited your other potential placements. Because if somebody falls in love with your music, they wanna just play it all over the place. So if you have a couple of albums, give your entire catalog, your artist catalog, exclusive sync licensing distribution rights to that one sync agent. Does that make sense? Interesting. And you should I have, you said that you would prefer if the exclusive sync agency approached me as opposed to approaching one because they'll have interest in me. Is that kind of what you meant? Well, I think you should definitely reach out to them. I don't think you should wait for somebody to reach out to you. So okay. you should definitely reach out to an exclusive sync licensing um, agent. Yes, or, or an agency or whoever it might be. Um, and definitely you should let them know who you are, what kind of buzz you have, how long you've been touring. Uh, the one thing that they said uh, at Sync Summit was really like, they want to make sure you really have a buzz. You're not just like, I just started my, I got my Wix website last week. Like I'm an <laughs> artist, right? They don't want that kind of a person. They want somebody who's actually been 100% <laughs> nose to the, to the ground, touring, playing, playing live gigs. One thing that they said that they love is being invited to a live show. So I know you're in Southern California now. There's a lot of them, obviously based in LA. Right. So, you know, trying to set up a couple of gigs and then reaching out to some that are in LA um, and inviting them all and just say, hey, would you like to come out? I, I've, I've checked out your guys' website. You guys have this interesting stuff. I'm interested in doing some sync stuff. I'm playing a show. Please come out. I got a couple of comp tickets for you. That's so much better than just an email or obviously, and it's way better than just kind of waiting for somebody to get in touch with you. Okay. But anyways, um, so let's move on. So Christina, where are you in all this? Where are you thinking you would want to land up in terms of the, um, the two approaches? Yeah, so ultimately I, it's like, I'm definitely refining my vision. I'm hoping that maybe with the music, placing my music in music libraries, um, it would help me create an income consistently, you know, consistently to build up maybe a more of support for a fan base for ultimately and wherever I can tour. I know that I've got connections in Nashville too, with seeing if there's producers who can produce my electronic music. And a lot of them, my songs, I feel like um, can be placed in like in ads, trailers, which I want to do as well and then also commercials in film and TV. So I think that kind of like having, I want to get a little bit more educated in more of the contracts, reading of the contracts, more informed and about the legal side of things and um, with music libraries and maybe, maybe get recognized through music libraries, um, you know, in shows and nationally, and then seeing if, you know, that could open doors for, um, also to get recognized in actual like for a fan base later on so i'm also definitely feeling like but i know that i also want to um maybe later on i can go on tour maybe if i get a little bit more experience exposure um to be on stage but i kind of have this vision where maybe i'll like want to like do more of electronic music but like maybe like, you know on stage and kind of like be able to impact people with you know more positive like sounds and just upbeat music and just bring a lot of healing to people so that's a little bit of my my goal there slightly. perfect yeah it sounds like you you got your clarity then of where you might want to go there we can talk quickly about um contracts if you guys want to i can give you sort of a brief overview 
of yeah. especially music library contracts. Like that's been what I've really specialized in. And if you guys have any questions, just go ahead and shout them out afterwards. So essentially, you know, always remember what is a contract. It's just basically clarifying what everybody's role is and what everybody's cut is. That's all we're talking about with contracts. People hear the word contracts and they get nervous and tense and scared. It's nothing to be scared of. It's just essentially to make sure that there's clarity in terms of if somebody's going to invest in you in time and money and resources, that they know what they can get from you, you know what you can expect from them. So that's all a contract is, it's basically a verbal agreement, you know, put in writing. That's really, so make sure that everybody's very clear that in a year or two, if you forgot what you agreed to, you can go back and look at that contract and oh yeah, that's right, this is what we agreed to and everybody's clear on it. Uh, we can talk about obviously exclusive music libraries. Um, many of them will offer you what they call a, a consideration fee, an upfront fee. It is different from a sync fee. I wanna make sure you're very clear on that. Sync fee is what you get when you get a placement. We're talking about before a placement, you just got accepted by an exclusive library. Many libraries will pay you upfront to exclusively distribute your music and just keep it in their catalog because it adds value to their catalog for their clients. So what are these fees? Well, they can be anywhere from on the low side, probably 25 to 50 bucks is the lowest I've seen to the high of 1,000, 1,500, even 2,000 I've heard of. Um, but to get those higher end fees, um, probably got to have a bit of a buzz about you. You got to have some sort of a reason why they could go to their clients and say, hey, guess who we just got on our catalog, right? If you're some kind of charting artist or some artist with a buzz, that'll make a difference for their clients and they'll be excited to know that they can start using your music. That would increase the amount of money that they can obviously uh, give you and because it, it'll add more value to their catalog. Um, and usually you're going to find that with those larger ends, you're going to have to have vocals on your tracks. So I've primarily been an instrumental producer. So for my career, I have not seen those larger, you know, thousand to $2,000 consideration fees. I just have not been in that realm. I'm more on the lower end, to, you know, hundred to $500 per track. So anywhere in there, um, which is still, you know, if you put out a full album and you can do an album a month, that's not chump change that can pay some significant bills and so that's just step one so we're not talking about sync fees yet we're not talking about uh back-end royalties of course so that's just for an exclusive library to uh distribute your music now not all libraries offer that some of them do some of them don't they don't have to if they don't offer them i would always recommend that you just say hey ask them do you guys offer consideration fees it's not in the contract you haven't talked about it if you do what kind of music would you be open to paying those consideration fees because it's not something you're going to earn your full time, excuse me, your income income off of, but having an extra five hundred to a thousand bucks a month coming your way for this definitely adds up and it makes a difference in your overall income. So that'd be step one. Step two is going to be obviously is it exclusive, non exclusive, but in this one we're talking about exclusive, meaning that they are going to ask for exclusive distribution rights for your music. Now for you, uh, Sonic, some exclusive libraries will be okay. Like let's say you want to give them um, your your album that's out there. Um, they might be okay with uh, you having your music out there, but the problem is going to be for you is that publishing, right? So they're probably not going to budge on publishing, and that's why I want to make sure you you probably know that that's not going to be a good fit for you. But for anybody else who, if you're not making any money on your publishing, you have no income stream, you do have some original artist music out there, but you'd like to maybe give sync licensing a shot, um, you, they might not have a problem with your music on Apple uh, Music, Spotify, that kind of thing, or even on YouTube, but you got to tell them. Always be transparent. Mm -hmm. Don't let them find that out in, in three months when they're searching on YouTube for you and they find that all of the music that they think they're exclusively distributing is just out there available for the public. Mm -hmm. That will be a big problem because it sounds like you try to do a bait and switch on them. So don't do that. Just let them know, hey, just so you know, my music is on iTunes. It's on Spotify. Here it is. Here's all my links. Just give them that clarity. Some exclusive libraries will have no problem with that at all. They'll be totally okay with that. But just obviously let them know. And then there's going to be a term. Um, some contracts will be in perpetuity, and I know that also freaks out a lot of people. And if there's no way to get around that, you're going to have to decide whether or not you want to commit some tracks to that particular library. So what I say, obviously, is you want to maybe partner with two exclusive libraries simultaneously. So let's say you give one library 10 tracks, you give another library 10 tracks, kind of see which one starts to give you a little bit more traction, which one keeps you more in the know, which one emails you, lets you know what's going on with their clients, right? The best thing you can see is a lot of clear and consistent ongoing communication so if one library kind of ghosts you and they go away you don't hear from them the other one's letting you know every single week here's what we're looking for can you pitch us this can you pitch us that here's what we're pitching your music to kind of a good sign that some good things are going to be coming your way so i'd never go blindly into one library for like a full year and hope that that was the right one you should have doubled down with especially if it's an in perpetuity clause um, because you could be setting yourself up to waste a full year's worth of work that kind of goes down the drain um, the other kind of terms I've seen out there that are more common now are two to three year uh, clauses that might have a reversion clause at the end of it, meaning that 
uh, for any track that they don't get placed at all, you can actually take it out of their catalog. Usually it's three years, 36 months. So if they don't offer that up front, maybe ask for that. Say, hey, do you guys offer a reversion clause? Are you open to that? And the reason why it has to be three years and not just like six months is because you got to give them some time to get their, get your tracks out there, to pitch them, because your tracks might not be relevant this quarter or this year, but maybe next year a new client comes on board and it's like, hey, we need tons of this music. And that happened to me, the music that you're producing. Um, also, every library has sub-publishers. That, that means that they basically have other libraries representing their same catalog uh, in other countries. So that takes time for that music to move all over the planet and to get pitched to clients all over the planet. So you do spread your wings pretty far out there when you work with production music libraries, which is really awesome. Um, in fact, the uh, BMG uh, VP of BMG Production Music was on stage with me at Sync Summit, and she said, obviously, when you sign with us, you're signing with, I, I don't I remember the number, but it's probably 20 or 30 different countries, you're immediately distributed through. So you're coming through us in our US market, but you're going into Japan and Germany and Australia and all over the place. You're going all over the world. So you're immediately getting like an army of people shopping your music out there, which is another reason why I think, obviously, libraries are really uh, smart way to go about it um so that was the terms uh usually with the uh, publishing a library is going to keep 100 percent of the publishing as i talked about before you should be keeping 100 percent of your writers if there's a library saying they got to take some of your writers watch out why do they have to be doing that unless somebody's co-writing your music with you your writer share that's been for me my primary bread and butter that's been keeping me employed and keeping me keeping my income consistent and growing throughout the last 11 years in this industry if i didn't have my writers royalties I, I don't think I could do this. If I was just uh, uh, only relying on upfront sync fees that come in once in a while, there's no way I'd have consistent income to be able to pay my bills. Um, so that would be the back end splits of the royalties. They usually keep the publishing and you usually keep the writers, usually a 50-50 split. Sync uh, fees, that would be the fee that you get when let's say your track is used for like a Ford commercial and they're gonna pay 30 grand for this Ford spot that they're gonna play in a, in a national campaign. Usually, now this is where there's always wiggle room, everything's negotiable and every library does it differently. Ideally, I should say, it should all be split 50-50, that they'll take 50% of that upfront sync fee for securing the gig, you're the composer, you get the other half of that 30 grand, so you get 15 grand for that upfront sync fee. Now this is where you've see, I've seen 75-25, 60-40, 80-20, I've seen it all. But ideally, you would hope that you could get that 50-50 split. That, that's just the, obviously the fairest, and I think that's that's a really nice uh, it's what a library should do if they really want to value their composers and let them know we wouldn't have these gigs without your creative content. So here's our thank you, you know, and also you couldn't get these gigs without us and our relationships. So it's a great marriage when that happens. When, um, you, say, other when you say 74 or 70, 30, then that's 70 to them and 30 to artists or? Correct. I don't think I've ever seen it where they're giving the artists most of the sync fees. Yeah, okay. so that's what I mean. Usually 50, 50 would be the best, but if it's going to be 60, 40 or 75, 25, yeah, it would be in their favor. They're going to be taking a vast majority of it. And the reason why it's obviously different is because every library has a different business model, has different uh, financial structures, has different um, uh, d different numbers of employees. I know many libraries that are like a one man operation. And so that's that's it. There's no employees and they're just that's them. So they can be a little bit more generous with that. Other libraries, they have a large staff. They have to support people. They've got an office. They've got you know bills to pay. So every library, and the same thing with those consideration fees. The reason why you think, well, why would a um, library ever pay consideration fees when they could not? If they're not forced to, there's no law, there's no union saying they have to. Well, a, a, a smart library that wants to be in business for a long time and wants to keep their quality of content, a quality of their music always high, they need to value the people that are giving them that money or that, that music rather, right? Mm -hmm. They need to pay money to the people that are actually giving them this high quality music. So if they go from like, hey, hey guys, I know we've been paying all these consideration fees, but just no more. We're, we're going to save that money and we're not going to do that anymore. Well, where are those high quality composers going to go? Out elsewhere, right? And so they, they, they risk like really lowering the quality of their, their catalog for their, their clients and their clients need high quality and high quantity of choices for their, their projects. So um, I think I have the basics there of contracts. You guys have any specific questions about that? Yeah, the only cloudy part uh, for me still is just like, uh, I think it's like just the exclusive and non-exclusive. And then um, just like, uh, I, I actually, my question is, it was actually for what you said about uh, the agencies where uh, you said there's a conflict when you say you pitch a song to like two or three agencies and then they get a placement. Then you said the, the music supervisors or the agencies kind of like get into conflict and like, why is that? And is there like, can you avoid doing that somehow? Well, what can happen is let's say that you sent the same 
let's say one song, make it very simple. You sent the same song to two different sync agents, sync agent A, sync agent B. Sync agent A gets the placement. So a music library, a supervisor went out there and sometimes a supervisor goes to multiple sync agents. They're not just going to one. So let's say that supervisor goes to both A and B to look for a song, likes okay. the song that they heard from A, B finds out that that is the same track that they're representing as well. And this has happened, the reason why I've said this, is this this uh, sync agent can then go, no, 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 we're representing that track, you need to pay us. This is the track that we're representing. And so even though it could be non-exclusive, you could get this conflict happening between these two companies where one of them saying, no, 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 we're, we're the ones representing, you gotta pay us, no, it's us. What happens is that music supervisor says, you guys are a mess, I don't wanna deal with either one of you. You guys are uh, making my life worse, You make, I, I don't wanna deal with any of this stuff, I wanna only work with exclusive companies. So what happens uh, is why I said maybe that non-exclusive uh, sync uh, agency is not the way to go is because they're probably burning a lot of bridges all, all over the place or maybe not burning bridges, but there might be a lot of supervisors that see, oh, that's the non-exclusive one. I'm not gonna go bother because they've heard of these horror stories or themselves have dealt with this sort of people battling over who's supposed to earn this income for these placements. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, thanks for that information. I just wanted to be clear because I'm trying to not step on people's feet, like not create conflict. So I was wondering how I can go about, because I, in my mind it was like, well, they're not exclusive. So how does that prevent me from pitching to another one? Because I'm it doesn't. doing it not, so it's not between, they don't have conflict with me, but no, they, it creates conflict within them, and then that's correct. Yeah, you are not the so. you are not the problem at all. You're you're following. It. Yeah, if it's non exclusive, it's non exclusive. The problem is the business model has shifted. Um, a little backstory on the library side of things about. When I first got started, there were a lot of non-exclusive music libraries, tons of them out there. And I worked with a couple of them. Some of them did better than others. What I noticed in the last five, basically about five years ago, uh, there was a switch going for all these non-exclusive libraries started to have to turn into exclusive ones for that particular problem. Tons of conflicts, tons of, well, it's our track, no, it's your track, um, retitling issues and nightmares with tracking and, and all that kind of stuff. So the same thing was happening in the music library world about five years ago. And I don't know when this started. I think this is maybe a current thing that's happening right now in the sync agency world. That was the vibe that I got. Again, it's not my primary place where I spend a lot of time, so I'm not an expertise, expert on it. But I think that's what's happening right now. So it's not a problem with you. It's not a problem with you violating any contract or whatever. It's a problem with the business model of supervisors usually just want to go like, when I go to you as a sync agent, I want to make sure that all, I can only get this music with you. Like this, if I get a track from you, we have no problems. You can clear it. You've already got the contract signed with the artist. We can negotiate directly directly with you and we're not going to have any of these other conflicts of other people with retitling and all that nonsense. I see. So your suggestion is uh, for my scenario with owning my publishing is you said to go for exclusive agencies. Is that what you, you suggest? Yep. Yeah. I think you should find one sync agent that you believe in that believes in you. Catalog. Say it again? To do the whole catalog and would you would that be perpetuity or no? No, they're not going to ask for in perpetuity. Uh, right. Sync agents usually will ask, as far as I understand, it's going to be like a year or two that they'll do, and there'll probably be a renewal phase right. where if you want to renew, um, it, it might automatically renew unless maybe you have to send them some sort of a notice 30 days prior to your one year or two years. Um, right. Yeah, I, I think as far as what I've been, that's what I learned. This is, again, something that I haven't done a lot of, but this is what I've learned from sync agents themselves, from Mark, um, is yes, you need to go... Uh, create a direct loyal relationship with one sync agent that loves you, loves your music, wants to be your advocate. That's the big thing. I think Mark really emphasized that. He's mm -hmm. like, you want somebody that gets out of bed and just loves you, can't stop playing you. Like they need to be a fan of your music, right? Not just like, oh, okay, I can make some money off of this artist. Let me pitch him. You want somebody that like, I love your music. I would love to work with you. I, I love all of the stuff you're doing. I can't stop playing it. You need to kind of feel that excitement. Why? As I said before, their main, they, they obviously need to make money, but their big ego driver there is they wanna break you, right? They wanna break you as an artist and be known as like, I fell in love, I discovered this artist, right? I broke this artist into the world. So that's why if they're like, yeah, okay, we'll deal with you, cool, non-exclusively, whatever. They're not, they're, there's no fire there. They don't really care about you, right? They're just like, yeah, whatever. If your music is right, now we can represent your music. That's not your partner. That's not your advocate. That's not somebody who's really on your core team. So okay. you might need to audition a couple of sync agents and ask them and let them know. Like, hey, I'm talking to a bunch of different sync agents. You're not the only one I'm talking to. Uh, I want to make sure that whoever represents me and really um, wants to work with me and I partner with them, they really believe in my music. They love what I'm doing. Um, and they're they're like a believer in what I'm doing with my music. So you got to get somebody who's basically a super fan. I would say that's the best thing you should do to... Uh, right. and, and how can I identify that as an artist before I sign into an exclusive contract? Like, 
how do I know they're not just, you know, blowing smoke? Like, yeah, we really want you in our library. Like, how will I then I be able to identify that? that well, usually, or, you know, just like how you'd find that if you show your music to somebody and they go, cool, Sonic, that, that was good. I like that. Is, is that a fan? Not a fan, right? So you can you trust your gut. Like your gut's gonna tell you, right? Yeah. Um, and I definitely get on the phone with them. Definitely don't just do email. No, I, I don't think you can really yeah. gauge so much on email. Uh, in fact, one way you can know is that let's say you do email somebody first just to sort of open the door. And if they email, email you quickly and say, here's my phone number, call me, or give me your phone number, I need to call you. That's okay. that's something right there, right? That they're showing interest, they're active. There's a, there's a spark that you ignited in them, okay? okay. So just go with your okay. gut on that kind of stuff. Thanks for that information. I really yeah. appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. Just go with your gut. You you know who's really excited about your music and who's just kind of like, you know, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, we love it. It's great. Here's our contract. And they sort of thrust it upon you. Um, and obviously, you know, anybody who's going to maybe, uh, hold on a second. My, my camera messed up there. There we go. Um, anybody who's going to rush you into anything and say, no, 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 you got to sign now. We got to do this now. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go with somebody like that. I would go with somebody who's um, not too hungry, not too desperate, um, but they just really show you that earnest uh, feeling that they really love what you're doing and they really want to represent you. And again, try to get them down to, if you can get just a, maybe a year, I would say just try to negotiate. Like, let's say they come to you and say, we want to get you for two years that we can represent you. See if you can cut that down to a year and say, hey, let's let's go for the year. Like, I want to see what you guys can do for me in a year. And if you guys are just, you know, knocking out of the park and getting me tons of placements and at least pitching, maybe not getting me tons of placements, but at least you show me that you're actively pitching my stuff out there, we can go for another year. But I need to see some results first. I need to see that you guys really are um, okay. doing what you said you were going to. Okay, sorry, Kate, because now, so you said that, but for libraries, you said it had to be two to three years because, but wouldn't the one year not be long enough to get the music like around the country or different countries? Well, for a sync agent, I don't know if they're going to be pitching in other countries. They're probably just going to be pitching directly oh. to their immediate. Um, yeah, libraries is a completely separate business model. So with libraries, they they pitch to the U.S. market for all their clients. But like I said, they all have sub publishers, right? So sync agents, yeah. as far as I know, don't have sub sync agents where they're like, all right, we represent this catalog, but we also maybe some of them do. Yeah. Um, but okay. we also are going to send this out to Japan and, and all that kind of stuff. A lot of times you're going to go directly to their um, their company and whoever their clients are who come to them, that's who you're going to get pitched to. It's just whatever's in house. But with libraries, you have a network of maybe 20 different libraries all over the world and all of their clients, right? So it's just two different yeah. worlds, two different business models. Okay. So just one more thing to clarify the other difference between the agencies and libraries, as you mentioned, with agencies, you're okay to pitch exclusively one album and pitch exclusively another album to another agency. But you said for, uh, like for, a uh, Sorry, you said libraries. Libraries, you're okay to pitch one album exclusively. And then, but for agencies, you suggest not doing that. That's right. Yeah, you can do that with sync agents. I just don't think it's a good idea. So okay. I would say get, if you're going with a sync agent, the whole catalog should go to the one that's your super fan, that's your advocate, right? Okay, so right. that's with sync agents. With libraries, they don't sign you as an artist. And I don't think you should give your entire catalog to one particular company. When they ask for an exclusive rights, I should have been clear on that. They're talking about exclusive rights just for that either one album or maybe a couple of tracks, right? That's what the contract's gonna say. We want exclusive rights for, let's say this one 10 track album you're submitting to us. So you would give exclusive rights to this library. Let's say you wanna go with another exclusive library, create a different 10 tracks. So now you're working exclusively with two different companies, but that's where you don't wanna submit the same music to both. That's where you get into that problem. But completely new music, completely different, you know, whatever melodies and chord progressions, right? And make sure they're not copycats of each other. Keep it different enough. Um, absolutely, you're completely following the, the, the agreements and you're gonna be uh, clear that way. Okay, cool. And, and I like do, I do yeah. recommend that because that's where you're going to A, B compare because you don't, okay. again, if you do have to commit a couple of years to a company to see what's going to happen, yeah, it, it is very foolish to blindly just jump into one company and go like, I'm, I'm in the good hand, I'm in good hands. You might be yeah. in okay yeah. hands, but maybe yeah. great hands are over here and you didn't know about it because you didn't yeah. partner with them. Yeah. That's why I was asking about how, how I know before going to an agency, uh, an exclusive agent because, and then also you said the exclusive library said they want a hundred percent of the publishing, but an exclusive agent, will they retitle the tracks or will they want any of the publishing? I, like I said, some uh, agents will want to get a piece of the back end publishing. This is what I've learned from Mark. 
um, but a lot of them won't. I think what I've noticed is a lot of them are just gonna be taking either between 25 and 50% of the upfront one-time sync fee for a placement. Right. So that's usually what you're gonna find is they're gonna just gonna pitch for you, hustle for you, not charge you. <laughs> and uh, when they get that placement, then you're gonna um, split that fee with them. And then if there's royalties and back-end associated, you usually are gonna collect. That's, I guess, the biggest major pro of working with a sync agent right. is that you can collect both the writer and the publisher share. So basically you're like doubling your royalties, right? But yeah. the number of placements are gonna be much smaller because you're just kind of throwing it out there and when your tracks are available and when they're the right ones for this right opportunity at the right time, then you I get see. the placement. So it's, you know, again, like everything in life, all the pros come with equal a number of cons. It's just a matter of which one kind of works better for your career. Cool. Yeah, and uh, Christina, do you have any questions about contracts, <laughs> legal stuff or anything like that? Um, not, I guess not as much now that if I've, I've uh, answered most of those uh, that you've answered what uh, Sonic had, had asked. Um, for me, I think my questions were just like what music libraries would you suggest from your experience that I should start off with? Um, I know this is aside from the contracts, but just like what music libraries would you suggest would be good to start off and maybe to look over and to kind of, you know, to kind yeah. of like put in. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah. what I do is because I get that question all the time. <laughs> so I have two uh, products basically that help you find those music libraries if you want to do that. Now, first of all, you can do it 100% yourself. You can basically do your own research. So if you want to just pull up a Google tab, type in production music library, TV film production music library, um, uh, TV film music library. I mean, anything in those combination of those keywords, um, you can find a lot of uh, production. They call them production music libraries. Um, <laughs> And, and just basically do your own research. It can take a long time. A lot of libraries are not great at SEO, so you're not gonna find a lot of them in a Google search, or you might find them on page 99 um, because they just aren't in the business necessarily of advertising to producers and musicians. So you're, you're not gonna find a lot of them, but you can definitely do your own research. So that is the long way, that's the hard way essentially, but you can obviously do that 100% yourself. I do have a music library directory for sale, and it is actually 300, over 300 companies that I update every single year of all different types of libraries. So there are TV film libraries, those are the ones that I recommend you guys partner with if you wanna get TV film placements. But there's also the stock libraries, the royalty free ones, the micro licensing ones, the ones that are different sort of income streams, not as sustainable, not as uh, passive income built because you're not gonna be getting those passive income BMI or, or um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. ASCAP royalties obviously with those. Mm -hmm. But yeah. anything that you can monetize your music with, I'm gonna put it out there for you guys to decide how you wanna do it. Um, so that's that's uh, number one. Number two is Sync Edge. So that is my more premium service. That's where I'm giving you my personal music library recommendations. So if you want to know what does Jesse think we should partner with, that's where I give you guys that. So that's the one where I basically put up two new uh, music libraries every single um, month. I think up to now we have, I launched it a, a little over, I think it was like two years ago. So we have over 40 in there. I think there's like 44, 46, something like that. Um, uh, music libraries that I've researched and um, and given you guys access to. And for every single library, what I'm doing is I'm putting up a full 10 to 20 minute video where I'm giving you the, the contact info, the URL, and then I analyze their um, catalog. And I can talk to you guys about that now. Like, how do you know if your music is right for that company and what signs of legitimacy should you be looking for? So it's very simple actually, but it's something that, you know, just because I've been doing it for this long, it comes as second nature to me, but I know if, if it's brand new to you, you probably wouldn't think of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So number one, you need to see what kind of placements have they been getting recently and um, the quantity and the quality of the placements that they're getting. Are they getting some major A-list films and TV shows, primetime network shows, that kind of thing? Are they getting more sort of, you know, four in the morning reality shows? Not that those don't pay. There's a lot of income that you can make on those, but there's just two different types of clients. Is it mostly, maybe it's mostly like ad campaigns that they're doing. They're mostly doing that kind of music. Um, it could be trailers that they're doing. So every library usually finds a little niche that they serve in the business. There's very few libraries, maybe the major big, big ones, they can do a lot of different things. But for the most part, you're not gonna be able to get accepted by those. You're gonna have to go with a smaller library the bigger ones like the Five Alarm and Mega Tracks, I do have music in those catalogs, but mm -hmm. I went through a smaller uh, catalog. I went through a smaller mm -hmm. library to get into those major ones. So mm -hmm. that's usually how you're gonna find that you get into those bigger companies. You gotta go through a smaller boutique, basically a music library catalog, and then you can get distributed through the bigger ones. So look at who they're serving, who are their clients, what kind of placements are they getting? And then you need to go take a look at their um, music and their catalog. And most libraries, you can go on their Source Audio website and listen to their entire catalog. So you need to see where does your music stack up? First of all, be honest with yourself. And this is the hardest part for all musicians and producers, but if your music is here and the quality you're hearing is up here, 
don't 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 shoot. Do not send anything to them. Don't think, oh, maybe they'll you know feel sorry or do this. No, you got to bring something competitive on their level, or obviously better. You got to bring something on par with what they already got, or better in that particular. So for you guys, I don't know, you know, probably singer songwriter. Uh, Sonic, I don't, are you rock? What's what's your primary? Yeah, genre? I'm rock. Sorry, I should have mentioned that a long time ago. She, she keeps saying she's EDM. I'm I'm pretty much <laughs> anywhere in rock from like alternative light rock all the way to like hard rock and even in like what I call like the classic metal, like where it's not like mo- like I wouldn't consider me metal, but like that that age of like where like Black Sabbath, like that kind of hard rock transition area. That's actually my favorite area, but I'm I'm all over rock. Perfect. Yeah. And it's good to be focused on one genre. So even though you in rock can go in all these different places, which is really cool, but you know what your core function is, your core uh, specialty is rock. And that's good. Stay there. Don't try to become, hey, well, I can do hip hop and I can do country and I can do orchestral. Don't do it. It's tempting. You cannot be all things to all people. You will become the, you need to become the singular focus and the powerhouse of one particular style. But even obviously, as you know, within rock, you can do all those different things. Same thing with you, Christina, like EDM. Yeah, I mean that is an entire. Oh my gosh! Like the the colors of the rainbow with EDM is crazy. Right? How many different things you can do? But you yeah. do need to probably even within that, I would say get one or two specific genres, uh, subgenres within EDM that you're like, I'm the future bass producer. I'm the whatever it is, right? Uh, island pop EDM, whatever you want to call it. Just go and and really get really good, really 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 good in that one sound, maybe two sounds, kind of a thing. And then when you go research that library. Mm-hmm. stack your tracks up against theirs mm-hmm. like play it side by side if you need to and just really listen is your mix as full as theirs is your track hitting as hard as theirs yeah. are your samples as live as energetic do you have transitions um does your music tell a story emotionally mm-hmm. um are you looping your tracks way too much right the one thing with production music if you guys are not aware i don't think you guys would be is you can never repeat a section twice in a track there's no reason to ever do that because an editor or supervisor or anybody mm-hmm. placing your music they also have these magical cut and paste operations on their keyboard so they can take your verse that they think yeah. is great and loop it 40 times if they want to so you don't need to give them repeat sections of your track you should be always adding something new so if you have a second verse something need, different needs to be there from the first one right same thing with your courses and usually as the golden rule your track kind of needs to be a one big crescendo so that your last chorus is that big epic part of it and always have a hit definite ending right a button ending no fade outs no slow you know 30 second meandering pad that kind of goes nowhere that's useless you need to make sure it just builds up builds up builds up big energetic big last chorus more the most uh energy that you've ever heard in the track and then yeah. boom the big epic hit and there's a lot of different obviously moving parts within all of that kind of stuff that's really, um yeah. that's really good thanks for sharing all that because we are actually co-writing song right now that's kind of more cinematic rock rock so i can do my cinematic electronic and blend with his rock and then so i'm kind of definitely for me it's a learning curve i'm, I'm kind of like learning more so i love to do spontaneous but like he Adam's able to kind of help me do the structuring to kind of like repeat it, you know, repeated sections, yeah. especially me learning how to do my transitions, my builds, you know, like taking off, like, um, you know, if there's drag and more defining the chorus, pre-chorus, reverse. So then kind of like to build that. So I'm kind of like definitely learning in that in co-writing to perfect my songs to, um, yeah, be more within like maybe the five minute and four, four minute instead of like a, seven minutes <laughs> yeah it's funny that you mentioned that because actually yeah. now that you say that it clarified that it's perfect for her because uh she she uh writes she doesn't repeat sections very much so i was always like as a songwriter i'm like i'm almost lost because i'm a songwriter right i'm like verse chorus you know all that stuff so it's perfect for her that she'll probably be in libraries perfect yeah and it's not like a complete reinvention of how to make music but it definitely has a different consideration and i think the the biggest thing you should always keep in mind is emotion um your music is basically primarily doing one thing when it gets a placement it's delivering the emotion that the producer of the content needs their audience to feel okay so uh one of the big things when i give feedback is there can be conflicting emotions like there's a verse that sounds very angsty and dark and very um uh something terrible is about to happen and the chorus comes in and we feel optimistic and hopeful now unless you're requested that like let's say there's a custom opportunity where they're like hey we have this commercial where it needs to be kind of tense and then lifts up into this inspirational moment unless you're being asked that specifically do never never do that you want your one track of let's say dark tense um uh, uh, attention essentially 
you want to deliver that emotion clearly and consistently throughout the entire track but without it feeling boring and like it's staying in the same place so let's say with just like dark tension let's keep that as like our theme you can have minimal dark tension to start the track then you can build it up to it's a little bit more intense now there's somebody at the door knocking at the door now we're at the point where there's like actual conflict it's still dark and it's still tense but now we actually have action happening in the track then we kind of subdue it and come back down now we're back in the minimal place but this minimal place feels a little different than this minimal place maybe this one's a little bit more lost a little bit more hopeless a little bit more like i don't know if we're gonna make it right then we rise back up to a big epic cinematic you know uh impact that we do for the last course and then we have that hit so each track should have one particular emotional focus that would definitely be the thing i would say always focus on and you can get there in all these really interesting creative ways with music which is so fun about this business is because it makes you think about music in a completely different way mm -hmm. whereas when you're you know writing songs for for your your band or your, for your fan base mm -hmm. um it's a lot about the lyrics obviously it's a lot about telling the story um and about just kind of like the sound like this the, you, know, you find something on your guitar like that's just a cool sound i'm going to make something out of it and you kind of you're kind of going into the unknown in your artist music with production music, it needs to be productive. It needs to serve a very specific purpose. And that purpose is always going to be one clear emotion. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely, uh, I like your tracks. I've been listening to your tracks yeah. just in the last couple of weeks. So uh, I kind of get that vibe from what you do as well. Um, Yes, awesome. Well, thank you. Awesome. And I wouldn't, I want to say this once before we go though, is no matter okay. which direction you want to go and you want to go with a sync agent, you want to go with a music library approach, there's risk with both. Like I wish I could snap a magic, press a button and tell <laughs> yeah. you, hey, you're guaranteed to get placements with this company. You're guaranteed to get placements with this library. I can't do that. Nobody can do that for you. And anybody who's guaranteeing you placements, I don't know. I just don't think anybody can guarantee you placements. There is no such thing as a yeah. guarantee in life. So I, I think that no matter which direction you go in, you have to accept a bit of risk. And I think that's why this industry doesn't work for a lot of producers. They're not comfortable with that much risk. But the one thing that I say is there's risk in your artist's music. There's risk in touring. There's risk yeah. in doing anything. There's risk in waking up and getting out of your bed, okay? A comet could come and hit and blow us all up. So there, <laughs> welcome to planet Earth. Risk is a part of things. We just got to, we're adults. We got to deal with it and we got to sort of do our best. So my approach is obviously to A, B, compare your way through music libraries. And I think with the sync agent world is trying to get maybe the shortest possible term you can. I think maybe a year is fair. Um, maybe you could even go for six months. I don't know. That might be too short, but you know, you don't, you don't want to insult them or whatever, but try to get it as short as you possibly can so that you really aren't going to be committing, you know, five, 10 years of your career to one company that may or may not be, you know, the best fit for you. So, but just be aware of that moving forward, there's going to be risk. And I think the best way to alleviate that risk or that fear that we all feel. And I definitely, you know, when I reach out to new libraries, I still feel this like, uh, they might not like it. I might not get it accepted. I still feel that 11 years in this business. The, the, my antidote to that is to be as focused on serving their needs as, as much as possible. So really doing my research, understanding who I'm submitting to, not spamming a bunch of companies, but going to one particular library, doing all my research I can, looking up maybe articles, interviews with the CEO or the A&R representative for that uh, company. A lot of them are out there. They have Twitter accounts, they have Facebook accounts. Do your due diligence and really look up who these people are. The more back story about this you can get, and I do that with Sync Edge, uh, any sort of back inside information. Uh, also in terms of I have other students that let me know that these libraries are doing well for them. So that's a lot, how a lot of them end up on the Sync Edge list. Um, cool. So do your research on that so that when you do submit to them, you know that you've given your best effort, you've really decided that they were the best fit for you, that you really feel strong about their, their chances of getting you placements, and just do your best with your music creation. Make sure you have the highest quality, most licensable stuff that you can submit their way. That's really it. And then if you see those signs of communication, you're getting placements, they're telling you they're pitching their stuff, you'll start to know whether you're in good hands or not. And if you are, double down your efforts. Just keep building your catalog, keep submitting your music to them, and keep supplying them. Or if it's that sync agent, Double your, your contract, renew it, let it renew for the following year and just let them keep doing it and then let them know when you have new music, hey, I just put out this and put out that. Always keep them in the, in the loop of what you're doing with your artist career. Cool. So with that said, any uh, final thoughts or questions that you guys have for me? Um, I'm pretty good, how about you? Um, yeah, so I know that uh, with like me branding as an artist, but I know I love to do like, you know, electronic, but also cinematic. And I know even with this course, they have it in like February, I think February 25th, where we have to produce four songs, you know, within like, um, like by February, by the end of the month. So I kind of like know that you mentioned, I know with EDM too, 
I love to do cinematic, but what happens is whenever I actually would create like cinematic, like maybe like, you know, like electronic sounds, then it kind of would morph into cinematic. But I know with like finding, you said maybe finding one genre to pinpoint, is it is it more so like if I love to do like cinematic and adding strings, you know, a lot of different like um, cool like electronic instruments to my, you know, piano, do you think that would be like, should I just hone in on more like EDM or maybe like, like more of a cinematic drama? So I know there's- Very, this. very good question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, it's a very smart question too. I would say, yeah, doing hybrids is what you're describing where you're gonna combine EDM and orchestral, essentially, yeah. uh, trailer yeah. music and EDM elements. Um, very smart thing to do. I do recommend, especially and even for you, Sonic, if you can do a little bit of a, a hybrid approach with some of your rock music, it's definitely a good cool. thing to get in, in, in the habit of doing and just getting comfortable with it. When you're yeah. just starting it, like if it's brand new for you, keep it extremely simple. So for you, what I would do is I would do one of these two different formulas. So let's, we're just going to take your specific example of EDM and orchestral. So one example would be EDM drums four on the floor, you know, and you have your toppers and you have all that stuff going on with the traditional EDM, whatever style of EDM it is. And then you can have orchestral elements playing your melodies, right? So you have horns and strings and woodwinds or whatever you want. They are basically supplying you the melody on top of this EDM track. So when I click play on it, I feel EDM. Immediately I feel EDM, but it's a little different because there's this like epic orchestral thing happening on top of it. But primarily that would be an EDM track with a little flavor of orchestral elements. And you can have some synths in there. You can have some EDM synths that play lead melodies or chord progressions or low bass. 808 right you can still incorporate some of that but that would be one formula but keep it very simple like that uh with hybrids a lot of times people try to go all over the place and combine all these different things and i think it usually never works out especially when you're brand new to it so that would be one formula where you just edm drums right just just in fact just do that first to create an entire track of great great edm drums have a cool verse that kind of builds up and then that big epic build every edm track gotta have that huge build into the huge chorus, right? Big epic, come back down to another verse, just do an entire track full of drums, then let's start to layer your strings on top of that. The other way you could do it is you have a primarily orchestral track where you have orchestral drums, you have uh, timpani, you have maybe some more, um, you know, kind of like uh, the, uh, I don't know if you guys use Contact uh, 5, but you can obviously use the Evolve. There's a lot of uh, libraries out there where you can do a lot of cool looping, percussive sort of sounds, very epic orchestral kind of things. Um, and so you sort of lay this bed of an orchestral track and then on top of that, you throw the electronic EDM elements on it, okay? So it could be uh, a, a kind of a chopped and screwed sort of a vocal that you do on there, um, beeps, uh, synth leads, whatever, it, growling, that kind of thing, right? You can go in all these cool, interesting directions, but then that primarily is going to be an orchestral trailer track with a little hint of EDM thrown in on top. And you can put your strings and horns and all that kind of stuff as well, but primarily when you hear it, you go, this is an orchestral trailer track, but it's got this little bit of, you know, it's like a little spice, like a little cayenne pepper of EDM thrown in there, right? So the same thing would be on the other version where it's like, this is an EDM track, a little spice of orchestral is in there though. That's where I think you should go and not necessarily try to do this 100% or a 50-50 where it's like you try to throw a little bit of everything all over the place. I think just have the foundation built in one genre, then add a little spice in the other. Does that make sense? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it does. Yeah, just one question on that. Uh, when you use like, uh, like you said, Contact 5, it's like looping percussive. When you use something like like that, that's di is that considered a sample? And like, because they say don't use samples for mm -hmm. like pitching to music agencies anyways. Um, oh, yeah. But, okay, let's like, talk about that. Samples, when they talk about samples, they're talking about something that you took off of somebody's re re released album. So obviously oh. hip hop, this is where it happens all the time, where people go take somebody else's vocal or they take a piece of a track and then they mess with it and create a new version. When they talk about samples, that's what they're talking about. No, when you're using, I mean, obviously always check the end user license agreement of any plugin, software, loops, anything that you're using. And it needs to say, this can be commercially used without any royal, we, we don't ask for any back end royalties. You're, you're free to use this in a commercial sense. And some of them will even put on there, TV film licensing is A-OK, -okay, right? So make sure you're doing that. But no, I'd say 99% of anything you're gonna find on um, Contact 5 uh, with all these like uh, sample libraries and loop libraries, 100% commercially available for you to use. So no, that's not what they're talking about with samples. They're talking about, you took that Dr. Dre lyric out of there, or you took an uh, uh, Imagine Dragons lead vocal and you did that. That's, no, definitely don't do that. Don't take anybody else's finished music. But we're talking about here, the building blocks of creating music, which is loops, plugins, samplers, that kind of thing. Cool, thanks. Awesome. 
Well, thank you guys so much for your time today. I hope this was helpful, useful, enlightening. And for those of you that watch this, this is definitely one of my longer videos on the channel. I'm really glad that you guys joined me uh, and hopefully stayed through to the end of this and that you guys got some clarity on where you guys might wanna go with sync licensing. Um, if you're new to the channel, you haven't heard anything about me or what I do, um, I do have a free five-day course that I will uh, link at the bottom of this uh, video so you guys can check that out if you wanna learn more about it. What I will guarantee you by the end of that course is you will know whether or not this is a good fit. You might know that right now. Maybe this scared you enough away. You're like, I don't want anything to do with it. Okay, good. At least you got that out of the way now. You won't waste any more time. But I can definitely tell you because I share with you guys uh, real income, real timelines for success, mm -hmm. uh, what really what kind of what the, the mindset it takes, the sort of patience and the consistency it's going to take to really turn this into your first part-time and then full-time income. So I do recommend you guys go check that out if you want to learn more about how to succeed, uh, at least follow in my footsteps of what got me through this crazy industry uh, over 11 years ago. So definitely check that out. And I'll have links to both of these guys' uh, music music, website, social media, anything they want to put out there. I'll definitely have that down uh, so you guys can check them out. So thank you guys so much for your time and we'll catch you guys next time.